Welcome to the first ever Harvard Wood Sports Roundtable. Today we'll look to take a look at how franchises are run and the role of sports in the evolving media landscape. My name is Karan Loda. I'm fortunate to be joined by three guests. Let me introduce each of them in turn. Samita Manukarama is the Director of Business Development at NBC Sports. She's also worked with the NFL and at Goldman Sachs. She's a member of the Class of 2006. Samita, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Pablo Torre is a member of the Class of 2007. He's a senior writer at ESPN and a regular panelist on Round the Horn and the Sports Reporters, and he started his career at Sports Illustrated. Pablo, thank you for being here as well. Hello. David Stearns is a member of the Class of 2007 as well. He joins us from Houston, where he's the Assistant General Manager for the Astros. He also has worked at the Commissioner's Office, as well as with the Mets, Pirates, and Indians. Dave, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Karen. So just to start things off, a lot of the folks listening in are really curious about how you got your start in sports. What was it that led you to go there? And did you have to fight your parents off to do it? Because I know at least one of you has an expired LSAT score. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. So, Pablo, how did you get your start? Yeah, so I was uh, not going to be a sports writer. I was not going to go into sports. I think I was like a lot of Harvard kids in that I was going to go to law school, which sounds so, so boring in retrospect. Uh, but I was, I took the LSAT my senior year. I wrote a thesis on child homicide in America, which obviously had no intersections with sports. I was going to do something related to the justice system, probably. But what I did do in college was write for the Crimson, the school newspaper, with Dave. And uh, I ended up taking an internship just because I figured that working for a year before going to grad school was going to be a good idea. So I took an internship at Sports Illustrated in Manhattan, did that for a, for a summer, and I was lucky enough to get offered a fact-checking job at Sports Illustrated when I graduated and decided to do that and at least try it out, uh, at least as a break before becoming a, uh, a law school sort of drone. And uh, I ended up never leaving. And last year, I was uh, approached by ESPN, and we had a good conversation, and I ended up joining uh, the Walt Disney Borg uh, for my full-time job. So I ended up, you know, from a very – I didn't have any other internships. I came at sports media – um, really with nothing else but writing for the Crimson and kind of dove into it from there. And I think one of the important things was, you know, number one, proving you could write and report and being willing to work up the ladder from fact checker and on up. And, uh, and yeah, I think Harvard was super helpful insofar as it gave me, I think, and hopefully it gives everybody this, but it gave me a reputation that was probably undeserved insofar as people sort of automatically pegged me for someone who was smart. And sort of playing off of that reputation while proving your worth, I think, was a, was a useful leg up, definitely. Samita, so, you also had sort of a non-traditional path into sports. You started at Goldman Sachs and then made your way over to the NFL. How did that pass sort of happen uh, yeah, sure. Actually, so my sophomore summer at Harvard, I actually interned at the NFL. I've sort of long been a sports fan and knew that I wanted to do some sort of career in sports. Um, so just sort of dabbled um, my sophomore year with that internship and had a great experience. Um, I decided to go into finance after that only because I knew I wanted to do something related to the business angle of sports and sort of felt like a, a structured program in business with training. Um, uh, you know, Harvard obviously being liberal arts, I didn't have, you know, a very strong finance background um, and things along those lines. So didn't end up going into finance. Actually spent a good portion of my year there working on sports deals, which was great. So I got to sort of see, you know, everything from sort of stadium financing to team purchases um, and things like that. Um, but ultimately, I did I did feel like I you know wanted to actually be working in sports more full time as opposed to finance. So after about a year of that, um, I was really fortunate. Um, an opening came up back again at the NFL, and I sort of kept in touch with people um, from my internship days, so was able to sort of transition from there and um, sort of have been uh, sort of in the industry ever since. So, yeah. And Dave, you've been a baseball fan forever. When did you know you wanted to work in baseball? Uh, I, knew, I knew I wanted to be a part of baseball probably since I was 12 years old. For a while, I hung on to the dream that it was going to be on the field, uh, but, but found out pretty soon uh, in high school that that wasn't going to happen, so I needed to find another avenue, and I probably took what is the most traditional path into working in sports, and that I knew I wanted to do it from a relatively young age. 
Uh, I played for as long as I could. I gave up a lot of home runs as a JV pitcher for uh, <laughs> for Harvard's baseball team, and uh, and then just started doing any internship I could um, in baseball. My my focus was baseball specific, not necessarily sports as a whole. And I think to some extent that served me well because I was able to uh, focus on what my really my passion was and and where my knowledge base was. And uh, I started in in college with an internship with a minor league team in Brooklyn. Uh, I did a couple of different internships with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And then after I graduated, one job kind of led to another. I, I bounced around from a couple of organizations and most recently was with Cleveland. And when Jeff Luno, who's our general manager here in Houston, took over, he uh, gave me a call, asked me if I wanted to interview to be the assistant GM. I interviewed, got the job, and a year later, I'm, uh, I'm here. So it's been a fun ride. Uh, sports is a lot of fun. It, it's challenging. Um, it certainly has its uh, it, its benefits and drawbacks, but it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there are certainly very high moments. So one thing that Pablo touched on is that when you get to a job in sports, you're often one of the only Harvard guys. Dave, I wonder if you could walk us through. Was that unusual for you? Was it you know did Paul Podesta kind of pave that path for you? Was it harder or easier? By the time I was looking for a job in baseball, there had been a number of Ivy League graduates who had done exceptionally well. Certainly Paul De Podesta is one of them, Theo um, Epstein's another, um, and really now the list goes on and on so that pretty much every front office has some Ivy League um, background in it, whether it's grad school or undergrad. So I wasn't quite as unusual a case um, as I might have been had I come along 10 years earlier. Um, but certainly as Harvard, as Pablo said, Harvard gives you um, that credential, and I'm sure I got a lot of the interviews I got simply because it said Harvard on my resume, and, and uh, that certainly made a difference. So, yeah. did you have, was it more helpful or harmful? I feel like the alien from Cloverfield is about to eat one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think the audio lapsed. Oh. In case you were wondering. Got it. Have, have we lost? Uh, have we lost Karn? Karn's gone, so I think we should all, all just Let's talk. <laughs> talk about our favorite TV shows. I also apologize because it looks like the sun is setting on my face. It's actually a light. I'm in my apartment. It's very dark. Oh, oh there we go. Back. There he is. There he is. Welcome back, Karn. There's two of you. There's two of you, but we can't hear either of you. <laughs> As a side note, Karn worked at Google, so... <laughs> he can hear us. He has really no excuse at this point. All right, am I fixed? All right, yes. You're good, yeah, welcome back. I apologize to the entire Harvard audience for my lack of technological ability. Apparently, they don't teach you that at Harvard either. Should have gone to MIT. <laughs> All right, so continuing on, <laughs> getting back to business. One thing that we've really seen with sports media recently, actually cable news. Hello? Uh oh Cable news. Like sports news. I mean, we've had some folks like Keith Olbermann go back from SNBC to ESPN, and we've just seen that sports has become this all-consuming thing for fans, but also for team executives and reporters. I wonder if you could each touch on perhaps how that 24-7 news cycle has impacted the way that you approach your jobs or how it's either given you uh, advantage. I'm going to jump in because yeah, I think Karen's technology answer. situation is, is very dire at the moment. But the thing that is crazy about sports media and the sports business world in general that I was surprised by was that everybody is on Twitter. Dave Stearns is not on Twitter that I know of. He may be lurking. I, I am not on Twitter. Samita, Twitter. I, I just saw you on Twitter. <laughs> This is probably for the best, uh, but I was surprised, at least in sports media, that everybody is pretty much on it, and part of that, I think, is a direct reflection of this insane 24-7 news cycle where everything could be turned into a nugget, whether it's for a cable show or whether you just look at the way transactions are reported. As Dave can tell you, yeah. you know, reporters are out there every hour trying to glean every bit of, of, of detail, whether it's 
ultimately interesting or not, that's just the way the business is. There's this appetite. I mean, it's a multi-bazillion, gazillion-dollar industry. I'm always reminded of the fact that the NFL is the nation's most popular TV show. And when you start with that premise that there's a ton of money to go around, it certainly filters down, I think, into every sort of crevice of the sports world. So being on Twitter, for example, and social media, I find that there's this crazy correlation between uh, people in my business and people who are paying attention to these things hour after hour, minute after minute. Dave, I wonder how that's, so we, one question we had from the audience was the question of incentives, which is, as you think about building for the long term or satisfying fans in the short term, you know, selling tickets, making sure that they have a popular product, how do you balance it's a uh, building a team and doing the right thing. It, it certainly um, can be a delicate balance, but at the end of the day, um, from an operational standpoint, you know that fans want to win um, and that revenue follows winning. And so, what we're focused on, and I think what most teams are focused on, is maximizing your winning window. It's really tough to stay competitive in any sport every single year. Uh, there are mechanism, mechanisms built into each sport that help teams. Uh, that help teams that are struggling at the moment compete in the future. So what we're focused on right now in Houston, we're going through a rebuilding cycle, and clearly our fans don't like that. Um, but we're focused on getting the organization as healthy as we possibly can so that when we do win, we're able to win for a sustained period of time, and it's not a one- or two-year flash, but that we can sustain the success like the Atlanta Braves have or the St. Louis Cardinals have or, and certainly some of the bigger market teams like the Red Sox and Yankees. I was actually going to ask something of, of, of Dave, and Samia, you can jump in here too, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting about sort of the trends in, in the sports world now is this, is this sort of embracing of data and yeah. analytics, and I wonder, I mean, I sort of as a journalist see this every day because the discourse and the conversation now is so stat-driven, and it's really easy to be a smarter sports fan. I'm wondering how in your respective jobs data and analytics ends up being a, a deciding factor on any, any level, really. It, it's an enormous piece of the puzzle. It's an enormous piece of the puzzle with everything we do. We are probably one of the more dr data-driven teams in baseball, but every team in baseball now has an analyst. Every team in baseball now has a, a number cruncher. Um, baseball is probably a little bit ahead of the other sports uh, in terms of uh, our ability to have data that goes back multiple decades now. We have very specific, finite data um, so we can predict with some degree of accuracy whether Derek Jeter can get to a ball 10 feet to his right. Um, and we can predict that because we know in the past how many times he's gotten to balls 10 feet to his right uh, and how many times that ball has gotten past him. Whereas maybe 10 or 15 years ago, you had to rely on a human's subjective opinion telling you, yeah, I think he can get to the ball 10 feet to his right, but I've really only seen him have to make that play five times this year. So... You know, it's, it's more of an educated guess. Um, we, have, we have a little bit more definitive proof right now when we're making those types of evaluations. And um, we're not alone, sir. I would say the vast majority of major league teams um, are using similar types of data. Sure, and then I think also adding to that from a little bit more from a media and content side, um, you know, it's a little bit obviously different than the team-driven side, but we've really seen a demand, I think, around the data if you look at, for example, our fantasy products um, and right. sort of premium stats and information driven through that. You know, we've done a couple recent deals, both through our Roto World product, um, and also, you know, even things like FanDuel, which are sort of daily fantasy products, um, which are for, you know, the hyper stats driven fans. Um, I think industry wide, you know, Pablo, you're, you know, spot on, obviously being at ESPN, you know, you saw the Nate Silver deal recently, you know, where you saw someone make that crossover from, you know, political, very sort of data crunching world to make that transition into sports and sort of the premium value, you know, he's expected to drive for the company. So I think that alone is sort of just a very telling, uh, telling indicator of sort of where, you know, where things are headed. And, you know, it's really driven by fans, smarter fans wanting to learn more um, and sort of consume more along those ends. So. Samia, so, yeah, you bring up an interesting point, which is really around the way that sports fans consume media today. Fantasy sports are obviously bigger than they've ever been, but even the way that you can get content has changed. You know, I can actually watch NBC sports games on the NBC Sports Live Extra app, which means I don't have to be at my TV as long as I have a cable subscription. I can authenticate. I can watch. Oh. Uh oh. How do you think that will be? <laughs> 
I lost would, you for the last like, three seconds last, of your yeah. the, la- the last three seconds were, how do you think that sports content distribution will continue to evolve in terms of how you reach fans? Sure. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, along with uh, sort of the stats and data-driven things, you know, sports fans or consumers that want the content wherever they want, wherever they are, immediately. Um, and so, you know, you've sort of seen sports uh, product offerings sort of match that. Um, so, you know, you see mobile offerings, you've sort of seen people's ability to stream games, you know, if you're not in your TV, um, people want to be able to get the content um, as soon, you know, as soon as and easily as they're able to. Um, and I think, I, you know, see that trend continuing to grow. Um, you know, people want, whether it's a full game, they want highlights, they want stats, they want, you know, companion experiences around products. Um, and, I, you know, I see that sort of trend continuing. Um, and also driving value for, uh, you know, for some media content owners as they're able to strike more deals to distribute their content um, across, you know, continuous platforms to get to a consumer. One thing that we've looked at, in regard to that was this phenomenon that happened in one February winter when a certain Harvard basketball player who had <laughs> sort of been in the backwaters of games, he was averaging like two steals per minute, but he wasn't getting into games very often. Well, we're going to find out if he was talking about Jeremy Lin in three seconds. Yes, I was talking about Jeremy Lin. And my question, and Pablo, perhaps you can talk about this, given how central you were to uh, the process and how you were involved with it, you were with uh, Sports Illustrated. What do you think it was about this era that might have contributed to Jeremy Lin's fame? Could Lin's sanity have happened 30 years ago? Yeah, I mean, I was, first off, I was central to the story in a way that a barnacle is central to a whale. I was sort of <laughs> attached and hung around for as long as possible and fed off of the ecosystem that was developing around Jeremy Lin. But you're right. I mean, I don't know if a couple of factors contribute to, I think, the Jeremy Lin phenomenon that were unique or are unique to the contemporary kind of sports era. I think immediacy and this 24-7 cycle we talked about, uh, I think that was a big part of it from a purely structural perspective. I don't know if you could have kept up with every highlight. I mean, and the thing to recognize about how Linsanity played out in retrospect was that it was basically two weeks, but it was an action-packed two weeks where everything was sort of compressed. And so you had people, I remember following these, I remember following the Raptors game when he sank that three-pointer to win from the top of the key in Jose Calderon's face. I remember tracking that on my phone on Valentine's Day or the night before Valentine's Day. One of those times when I should not have been uh, on my phone tracking this. <laughs> yes, it was very romantic. Uh, but that was, I think, a function of, of the era where people were sort of so hungry and their appetites were so large for Jeremy Lin and, and sort of figuring out who this guy was. And then you had these mechanisms to, to sate that appetite. Uh, and then on top of that, I mean, if you want to talk about... I mean, there are a billion little sociological threads you could tug at, but I think the other one, obviously, was was race. And, and, and in the modern... Era, one of the things that was unique in sports and remains unique in sports, to be perfectly honest with you, I think on all levels, whether it's behind the scenes, on the court, wherever it was, was being Asian American or just Asian, period. Uh, I think having a guy who looked like, I mean, 6'3 is, is short in the NBA and it's normal compared to like, obviously like a Yao Ming, but having a guy who seemed like he was otherwise mortal, uh, being Asian American and doing all the things he was doing, what was this was both a novelty and this had had this feeling of, of historicity almost where you sort of wanted to see what was going to happen because you weren't sure if you were ever going to see that again. And I think both of those things were almost unique to 2013, uh, both in the fact that it happened but also in the fact that people were had access to that story and were, ha- were having conversations around it uh, on a near constant basis. So Jeremy Lin represented this quantity where he was both a basketball player who was doing very well, but he was also this marketable quantity that the Knicks clearly fed revenues off of. And Dave, I wonder how you think about that in that we've seen teams over and over keep players past their primes because they're ticket sellers, Barry Bonds being a prime example. You know, it seems like 
you want to do the right things to build a team, but ultimately there are some players you keep around for loyalty reasons or revenue reasons. How do you think about that as you fill out free agent spots or, or re-sign veterans? Um, it's a challenging problem to have, but it's also a really good problem to have if you have one of those transcendent players, whether it's a you know a Jeremy Lin type figure um, in New York, even though they let him go, or a Derek Jeter in New York and Barry Bonds in San Francisco. Um, that player at some point has been one of the best players in the league, and that's a really good attribute to have on your team. And if the player has uh, enmeshed himself in the local culture and the local market to the point where the fans don't want to see him go um, for something other than how he's playing, uh, that's a pretty special relationship. Now, you obviously need to be careful because you can get yourself into uh, some pretty harmful long-term contracts um, that could torpedo your chances of winning uh, in the immediate future. Um, but there is, there is a value to keeping continuity to a team. Ultimately, we're constructing teams for fans. We're constructing teams as entertainment, and the entertainment is better when we win. Um, but there is, a, there is a balance between revenue generation um, and straight efficiency of team construction, and we're cognizant of that in our decision-making. Um, when it gets to the level of a Jeremy Lin or a Derek Jeter or a Barry Bonds, those are very good, they're difficult, but those are very good decisions for an organization to have to make. Samita, as we think about these kinds of issues, there's both the issue of sports as a business, and certainly for Dave that is very central, but there's also the idea of sports as entertainment. And yeah. one thing that all entertainment companies like NBC and ESPN have to balance is this idea of journalism, but also entertainment. So. Is Tim Tebow news, or is he just what's going to get you ratings? You think about that from a business perspective, um, to the extent that you do advise NBC Sports as journalistic operations, but also in terms of what content gets front and center um, and what you how you cut deals. Yeah, I mean, sure. To be honest, I, I do not you know sort of interface much with the journalistic side of things, but I you know I certainly understand uh, you know the tension that you may face with that. I mean, anytime you turn on Sports Center, or a lot of other shows, the Tebow, for example, is sort of a big one, or you know, there, you know, a couple stories like that. Um, you know, from a business perspective, you know, we like to do, you know, if there is a story or a, a personality or someone that's sort of big and, you know, driving, you know, consumer engagement, we obviously, you know, do want to be able to provide content, you know, to that effect. But at the same time, I think it is definitely a, you know, a careful balance you have to strike between, you know, you know, being a serious journalistic or news outlet, you want to sort of cover what's relevant and what's important instead of, you know, you know, sometimes bordering on maybe the sensationalistic or other aspects of it. But yeah, the most certainly, I'm sure Pablo, you may, maybe have a little bit more to speak to that, being more on the journalistic side of things. But at least so, sort of from what I've interfaced with at, at NBC, that certainly is the case. So. Yeah, I mean, there definitely, I mean, I don't think there's any, I don't think I'm breaking news here by saying that ESPN has talked about Tim Tebow too much. Uh, I think that's been acknowledged by various people within ESPN over the recent months and years. But the thing that I mean, and then this is, so I'm a journalist, and I don't really give a crap about Tim Tebow, but I do recognize that there is this market that exists for him, and that as much as ESPN ought to get raked over the coals for broadcasting Tim Tebow back when he was something, or at least a shadow of something, uh, I think the ratings always backed it up. And, and I guess there is a chicken or the egg sort of thing here, right, where is ESPN creating Tim Tebow, or are they meeting a market demand? Um, that's an existential question that I'm not equipped to deal with at this moment. Uh, but I do think that in a perfect world, I mean, what I would like, I would like to see any sports network that I work for, any magazine, any publishing company, whatever, I would like to see them, you know, obviously take the high road. I would like to see them sort of move past what the market may demand. I mean, this is... And this links into like the fact that America's number one sitcom is like two and a half men, right? I mean, it's yeah. I don't think it's smart, I don't think it's good, but it exists. And I certainly, at some point, you know, you don't want to be too high-minded and necessarily condescend to everybody who wants to read and hear about that, even though that's exactly what I just did. Uh, I, I do think, <laughs> but I, I do think that there is obviously like a very tough line to walk. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is that. You know, sports is, for better and for worse, this multi-gazillion dollar industry we're talking about, it's entertainment. And part of that compact, I think, is to also keep in mind that in a perfect world, we would not take everything as seriously, right? I mean, I, I think media critics have 
have a have a tough job, a job that I respect. I know a lot of people who criticize sports media for a living. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's always important to remember, you know, that a sports network talking about Tim Tebow is not the same as a, a cable news network ignoring Syria, right? I mean, there's sort of a birth that hopefully we can allow for absurdity and entertainment that you wouldn't allow to other industries, and that's probably, I think, a good thing. And sure, and one last thing to add on there, you know, I think, you know, Tim Tebow, for all it's worth, you know, you know, from at least from an NFL and other perspective, you know, that does bring new fans and new sort of, you know, at least from a media company's perspective, you might have people tuning in that might not otherwise be doing so. So, you know, that's, you know, just another consideration as well. So. Right. Do you guys think there's a different place for that in terms of, and maybe Pablo, you, have, you can speak to this, in terms of TV versus the website versus the magazine? Are there different kinds of content in term, that would be more serious journalistically or more... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's all specific to what kind of... I'll use the word programming because it's sort of a broad umbrella term, but, like, whether it's what kind of a magazine are you doing, what kind of a TV show are you doing. So, for example, if it's First Take, the morning show on ESPN that has focused on Tim Tebow so much... If it's that, I mean, you know, what else is going on in that time frame, right? It's like morning television. It's not the PBS level programming. Um, and that's sort of not its mission statement. But if you're going to, and you can argue where Sports Center falls along that spectrum, whether it's more increasingly morning showy or whether it's sort of hard newsy, you can certainly debate that. But, you know, if it's outside the lines, I mean, outside the lines, I, I think, has, has done the best job in terms of avoiding. Uh, some of the stuff that gets criticized most often uh, just as being sort of these ratings, catnip sort of things. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, look, I think one of the challenges if you're working in a 24-7 uh, news culture is you want to have a little bit of both and you don't want too much of any one thing. And if it was up to me, as I said, it would probably skew closer to some combination of, of, of smart and, and not necessarily serious. I mean, I'm, around, I'm on around the horn where... You know, today I debated with Woody Page, and yesterday or two days ago I made, like, fake burp noises. So that's certainly not, uh, you know, ha doesn't have the gravitas of, of an outside the lines. Uh, but I think that there's a place for that, and there's a way to be fun and smart and entertaining without, you know, pandering or without being uncreative. And I think the creativity is kind of... You know, you can talk about Tim Tebow all you want if you're interesting, right? Like, if you have a creative take on Tim Tebow, bring it on. That's great. It's just when it's sort of just, like, beating you over the head with it, and it's not interesting, and that's the problem. I mean, the topic itself is inherently silly, but then again, every topic in sports on some level, uh, or on most levels, is, is probably silly as well. So a lot of people would actually kill to just be able to have on these issues. And one question I got emailed into me, almost everyone that responded was, how do I get these jobs? You know, how do I become Dave or Pablo or Samita? Uh, and Dave, maybe I'll start with you since there's been books written about people trying to get into baseball, especially through the analytics mindset. What advice would you give to a Harvard alumnus who maybe is, is still, or either a Harvard college graduate who's just getting into the real world and wants to find their first job in sports, or perhaps someone who's had a different career but wants to transition to sports? I think there are, there are two really good pieces of advice that I got. And the first is um, be open-minded and very persistent. So, you know, we come out of Harvard and we kind of think that um, maybe something is owed to us or, or we deserve a certain level of compensation or benefits or, you know, health insurance, something like that. Um, in sports and entertainment in general, you kind of have to pay your dues before, uh, before some of those things come your way. Um, and the second is, you know, we, I'm sure all of us and anyone in sports and entertainment, you get resumes all the time. Um, a lot of them look the same, and so anything you can do to differentiate yourself um, from the other stacks of resumes that, that come up on desks are helpful. Um, I have people who will send me scouting reports that they've written. They've gone out on their own. They've scouted college players or high school players. Um, most of them we've seen internally, so I have something to, to look at and compare their evaluations to what our scouts are seeing. Um, some people will do an analytical project and send that to me. Uh, and, and that's really helpful to see that someone's taking the initiative, uh, doing some work on their own, and that they have a skill set so that when they show up on day one, they can add value. Um, most sports organizations, and uh, I don't know whether media outlets are the same, but most sports organizations are really thin. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time to have people train for a year or a year and a half to get up to speed. Um, so when people show up, we expect them to work from day one and add value to, from day one. And, 
that's really the main part of the interview and the application process is, is making sure that uh, that, that skill set and that um, immediate help uh, exists. Sure, and I think to add to that, oh, sorry. Um, no, I was just going to throw it to you, Samita. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, definitely a couple of those things. And the other thing is, you know, you know, just to use your friends, use your networks, use your resources. I mean, I remember, you know, in the last couple of jobs, you know, if you apply for a job on online posting, you know, you get we get like a thousand, two thousand resumes per job, and it's really hard sometimes to sort of filter through the masses. So, you know, to the extent you can sort of network, you know, reach out to any one of us or any anyone you may know to get your your resume actually in front of someone as opposed to an online application. It's a little thing, but I found that sort of tremendously helpful. I'd say about eighty to ninety percent of people we hire are people that are friends of friends or someone that came in sort of through a direct contact, as sort of opposed to an online application. And what I, all I would add, I mean, is, I mean, in my, in my business specifically, I think you need to be able to write. Uh, that's sort of the fundamental skill. Once you can do that, I think a lot of things become easier. Uh, but the term like add value, I think, is accurate uh, for sports media and sports journalism as well. I think and one of the advantages that if you went to Harvard or are a smart person, period, regardless of the brand, I mean, I think there's an appetite. And I think this is sort of dovetailing with what we talked about in terms of like the data movement in sports. There's an appetite for people who can think critically and intelligently and not use the same cliches, right? So there was a time when everybody on TV that you would see was a former jock. I am the opposite <laughs> of a jock. I mean, I didn't play any sports in college. I didn't do any sports in high school outside of like playing pickup basketball with my friends. And so when you're talking about adding value, I mean, that is sort of the perspective that I hope to bring. And to be honest, I don't think there are a lot of me still in sports media, people who are unconventional by virtue of the fact that they didn't play sports firsthand on a really high level. Uh, and if you can prove that you know what you're talking about and that, you're, that you are making up for your deficiencies athletically, and, and by the way, no one's like playing pickup basketball as a matter of like whether you're getting a promotion or not. Uh, but if you can prove your deficiencies in terms of like first-hand expertise with, with, your, with your thinking skills, with your writing skills, with anything else, I think that's a way to add value in a different way that, that uh, a lot of sports media types maybe uh, aren't so familiar with, which can be a good thing. And the last thing is just to be multi-platform. Uh, I think the way sports media was going, and, and Samita was talking about all these screens, I think screens are, are they're not going away and they're not getting fewer. I think the more comfortable you are, whether it's doing a video thing or doing radio or being especially web fluent, I think all of that stuff is incredibly crucial uh, to bring, especially as a young person. I mean, if you're a young person starting in sports media, uh, I, I would try to leverage, again, talking about the added value concept, try to leverage the fact that you know and you are native to this, this sort of landscape. Uh, and that's something that the people who are hiring maybe even aren't as familiar as you are, and that could be a, a good tool. This has been a really insightful half an hour. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining me today, and thank you to the audience for joining in. Apologies for technical difficulties, but I hope you'll join us for our next Sports Roundtable. This is Harvard's first Sports Roundtable with our guests Pablo Torre, Samita Manurparama, and Dave Stearns. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks.